Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 29th of January and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 1st of February 2021. And it's certainly been a month of two halves, um, certainly the early optimism that we saw at the beginning of this year has quickly given way to much higher levels of uncertainty. There's been a number of factors around that. Obviously, this week's uh, volatility um, over Reddit stocks has been a large has has been a large part to play in some of the volatility that we've seen this week, and and to a lesser extent, some of the declines that we've seen this week as hedge funds have to take margin calls. Um, and liquidate profitable positions to cover the margin calls on their underwater short positions. And I have to say, who wouldn't who wouldn't have a permit themselves a wry smile um, at that particular prospect as suddenly retail investors suddenly discover that they have a decent mechanism um, to be able to influence what goes on in financial markets. Anyway, having got the disclaimers out of the way, we can now have a quick look back at some of the events of the last few days, namely that the GameStop story is only one part of what's been driving markets this week. And if you contrast what's been driving markets this week to the to the optimism and exuberance that we saw as we came to the begin as we came out of the end of last year and at the beginning of the month, the so-called reflation trade. Um, optimism over vaccine rollouts, optimism over fiscal stimulus. That appears to have all gone by the by. Um, and now the tone and sentiment is markedly more negative than it was at the beginning of the month. But let's have a look at and see how much has actually changed from that early week optimism or early year optimism or early month optimism, whatever you want to call it, and where we are now. And I would argue that while the politics certainly got an awful lot more complicated, you've only got to look at the European Commission's um, reaction to AstraZeneca um, and the fact that European Council President Charles Michel this morning raised the prospect of seizing control of vaccine production in an attempt to get the EU's own botched vaccine program back on track. Um, I think that gives you an indication of the fact that the EU is running scared. They're running scared because ultimately they pretty much screwed up their procurement process when it came to um, the vaccine program. And the fact that the UK um, stole a march of three months on them is making them look bad and obviously AstraZeneca is a good whipping boy. Um, let's not forget as at the time of speaking the European Medicine, Medicines Agency is due to give the AstraZeneca vaccine a green light today. So at the moment AstraZeneca is not allowed to distribute it um, amongst the various counterparties in Europe that have bought its vaccine. We've also, but it's, this is not just an AstraZeneca problem, it's also a Pfizer problem as well because Italy is also reporting that it's had to halt its vaccine program because it can't get enough Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine vials. So we've got Spain, we've got Italy, we've got France, we've got Germany pausing their vaccination programs because of um, vaccine supply problems. So it's very easy to blame AstraZeneca because it's a British company, but ultimately the EU have been caught out and they've and not understand, you know, not unreasonably, European governments are holding them to account. And why shouldn't they? It was supposed to be easier, right? A block of 27 countries negotiating en masse for a vaccine program. Not unexpectedly, obviously, um, pharmaceutical shares have come under pressure this week because ultimately they are caught in the middle. But even amongst all of that, the vaccine program is still going to get rolled out, albeit at a slightly lower pace. I think one of the other things that's concerning investors is obviously the fact that extended lockdowns and tighter restrictions are now being pushed potentially into Q2. There was a perception at the end of last year 
that all of the restrictions that we were talking about over the Christmas and New Year period wouldn't extend beyond the first quarter of this year. It is now becoming very, very clear that that will not be the case. And as a result, markets are having to price in the prospect of a recovery deferred or delayed as opposed to a recovery that's more imminent than not. And that is why I think you're seeing um, a little bit of equity market weakness as we head into month end. So let's start with the FTSE 100. It's always a good idea to look at the the daily charts here. So this is the FTSE 100. You can see I've drawn a nice little neckline through here, through here even. We're still just about holding that trend line, but even if we do break below it, we've also got a fairly decent area of support around about 6,300. The one thing that worries me about this is the fact that we have seen some very strong thrusts towards the downside without too much in the way of a rebound. So I think there's certainly an awful lot of nervousness if you compare the, the, the moves at the beginning of the month and now the end of the month. So from trading above 6,900 in the first week of this year, we've given up all of the gains that we saw in the first week and are now probably just about negative on the year. Um, well, I think we're just about flat at the moment because of where we closed. We closed on New Year's Eve on the 31st of December around about 6,461. So we're currently flat on the year for the FTSE 100. So these sorts of levels right here are going to be a very key arbiter of where we go to next. I still am fairly positive on the FTSE 100, but this does worry me a little bit because this potentially could be the beginnings of a reversal but I'm not prepared to throw in the towel yet because we are still above the 200 day moving average. It just could take us a little bit longer to get where we're supposed to be going. If we look at the DAX, for example, it's a slightly different picture, but again, no less have we seen some very big days this week. You can see that from how long these candles are here. Nonetheless, um, we are also around about where we were on New Year's Eve, albeit maybe slightly below those levels. And that is indicative of uncertainty. The market's trying to make new highs. It's trying to push higher. It's not able to. It suggests that investors are reluctant to hold on to anything for an, any extended period of time or on traders more broadly. So I'm looking probably around about 13,200 as a fairly key support level. US markets, on the other hand, have been slightly more positive, but nonetheless, even here, we have seen some evidence of a little bit of nervousness. We can see that with the 50-day moving average, this strong thrust lower here. An awful lot of the gains that we've seen over the course of the past month or so have been very tech-driven. Um, we had another bumper quarter for Apple this week, $111 billion. You know, I mean, that's a stunning number. I, I, I didn't, did, I did not expect that, particularly when you look at some of the consumer numbers. But I'm guessing, uh, and I'm, I'm slowly beginning to realize that um, buying Apple products, consumers generally don't tend to be that price sensitive. I'm just surprised they buy so many so often. I still got the same iPad that I bought three years ago, and it suits me just fine. But I'm guessing there are those Apple fans out there who want the very latest product. What's more important as well is that services is making up a much greater proportion of um, quarterly revenue for Apple. So anyway, that, be that as it may, 50-day moving average in this trend line here is likely to be a key support level on the S&P 500. You can also look at the NASDAQ. It's a similar sort of story. We've got a very nice trend line coming in here. Also coincides with the 50-day moving average. So particularly US markets, I'm paying particular attention to the 50-day moving average and the trend line supports on the NASDAQ and the S&P. Um, so, I mean, that, I think that sort of gives you a nice little pricey of where we are at the moment with respect to equity markets, but also the pound, which has really performed well this month, but at the moment is finding the air a little bit thin around about 137 and a half. Now, what's encouraging about this, not the fact that we can't break above 137 and a half, is that we are finding the dips so far contained to 136. So the pound is trading in a fairly decent range. 
the outlook still remains fairly positive. And I think the pound is benefiting from what is being colloquially referred to as the vaccine trade. Ultimately, the UK vaccine program is much more advanced than those in the rest of Europe. And as a result, the pound is benefiting from that on the premise that the UK will be able to lift restrictions an awful lot quicker than Europe. And ultimately, that should release some pent up consumer spending for consumers to spend at home. I think it's important to remember that it's unlikely that we UK consumers will be taking any foreign holidays this year, simply because I think vaccine restrictions and virus restrictions or vaccine passports could well be the order of the day. People have been saying that vaccine passports are on the agenda, but I think that's um, I think that's naive. I think an awful lot of companies will insist, holiday companies will insist that you have a vaccine passport before you travel. Saga is already insisting of evidence of a vaccine shot before they will allow you on one of their cruise ships. So I think that is essentially the direction of travel. And I think it's naive to think otherwise, no matter what your feelings are about having to prove that you've been vaccinated or not. Ultimately, I think that will be that will dictate how strong the recovery is. And I think what that will mean is that any vacations or holidays that are taken this year will probably be domestic in nature. And that is likely to be positive for UK businesses. And as a result, despite the awfulness of the economic data that we've seen this month, the services PMI, the flash PMI, which was below 40 for um, January this month, and which we're likely to see um, not much of an improvement in the ordinary PMIs when they come out in the week ahead, the likelihood is that um, that will keep the Bank of England's powder dry when they meet later in the week, in the first week of February, on the 4th of February. And that's, 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 the first, that's the first item on the agenda when it comes to looking at the week ahead. We have the Bank of England meeting on the 4th of February. Now, I think it's very unlikely that the Bank of England will do anything more than they already have done. They increased their bond buying programme in November by 150 billion. There had been some speculation that the central bank might go further by cutting rates into negative territory. I think we can safely assume that is not going to happen, judging by the recent narrative that we've heard from Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor. Now, while some on the MPC still appear enthusiastic about the prospects, it's hard to see how cutting rates further can help an economy that is essentially shut down. You know, we are where we are. Um, we can't go out and spend any more money than we already are doing because we're all confined to our houses. So with Brexit in the rearview mirror, yes, there, are, there will be um, some bedding in problems. We've already seen um, business, um, business organisations criticise um, some of the delays and some of the problems that they are currently facing as a result of what's happening at the borders. Um, but with Brexit now in the rearview mirror, I think it's more than likely that the Bank of England will adopt a wait and see um, policy, placing their hopes on the success of the vaccine rollout program, which is well ahead at the moment of pretty much everybody else's with the exception of the UAE and Israel. So that's the pound against the dollar. Still bullish on the pound against the dollar and still bullish on the pound against the euro, even more so given the fact that we finally managed to break below the 8860 area. Okay, what we've seen at the moment has been a little bit choppy, but ultimately I think unless we break back above this 8930 level here on euro sterling, we're going down. We're going down and we're going down probably to um, back to these sorts of areas down here around about 86 and even further. Um, the vaccine trade, I think the direction of travel is positive for sterling. And as a result, I think we can certainly see further sterling gains going forward as the economic data continues to play out. We've also got services PMIs more broadly this week. 
China and the US aside, they have been poor. We've got uh, France, Germany, it's Italy, um, and Spain services PMI. Flash, the recent flash PMIs have been very, very weak. Notably, the UK ones were even weaker. I mentioned that earlier. But ultimately, I really don't think that we're going to see anything um, above 50 um, in the services PMIs when they come out um, later in the week on the 3rd of February, which is the Wednesday. We've also got the US employment report this week. That's the other macro item that I'm looking at this week. And obviously, I think that will um, affect the dollar, which still remains in its downtrend, but is starting to show flickers of a potential rebound. But at the moment, we're still below this 960 level on the CMC dollar index and this downtrend line here. So at the moment, while the outlook for the dollar is looking slightly more positive, all of these, all of this optimism about fiscal stimulus is starting to be tempered somewhat by the fact that it's unlikely to happen probably much before March. And if it does, it could well be less than the $1.9 trillion that was originally outlined by President Biden in his uh, initial speech just before he was inaugurated. Um, the $900 billion that was passed at the beginning of the year runs until March. So US politicians have the ability and the headroom to continue to procrastinate on how um, and why they and how they direct any new stimulus package. The likelihood is it's probably coming, going to come in less than $1.9 trillion, but ultimately it'll still be much more than what the EU recovery fund is, which has finally been approved, $750 billion, euros rather, 750 billion euros, 390, 390 billion of which is grants and which still hasn't been allocated and probably when it is, it won't be anywhere near enough. So we've got EU fourth quarter GDP also coming out. Euro dollar is starting to look a little so on the soft side. We've got we've had various jaw boning ECB officials talking about the fact that they're uncomfortable with the level of the euro where it is. They're talking about the potential for cutting rates further. Um, earlier this week, we had a number of EU officials saying that the markets were underestimating the possibility that the, e the ECB might cut rates further. This was Klaus Knott, the, um, or Klaus Knott, however you want to pronounce it, or the Dutch ECB um, governing council member. I think the key thing here for um, the euro is this one twenty seventy area. I've highlighted it consistently throughout the month in my commentaries. And for me, that's the key line in the sand. 120.40, there or thereabouts. If we break below 120.40, this would complete a potential head and shoulders reversal on euro dollar and potential target a move back of around about 300 points down to around about these lows, 117, 118. So keep a close eye on this 120.40 area, ladies and gents, because that could potentially confirm a head and shoulders reversal and a break lower towards the downside. Now, in terms of um, other things that we've got, obviously got non-farm payrolls on Friday. That's probably one of the key, another one of the key items this week, and, and that will be closely monitored for um, whether or not the number that we saw in December was a one-off. We saw 140,000 jobs lost in December, it was a bit of a surprise, and coming on top of a similarly negative ADP jobs report, this number will be closely monitored as to whether or not we get a rebound. Certainly, the weekly jobless claims numbers that we've seen over the course of the past month or so would appear to suggest that the big spike to around about 950,000 that we saw um, in the lead up and aftermath of the Christmas period has started to taper off and the jobless claims numbers are now starting to come down. So in terms of the weekly jobless claims numbers, they have been improving over the course of the past couple of weeks. That is very, very welcome. Of course, whether or not that translates into 
and improvement in non-farm payrolls is anybody's guess. Nonetheless, after the 140,000 job decline that we saw in December, there is a small expectation that we might see a gain of around about 50,000 jobs in the January numbers. So um, there is a hope that we might see an improvement in the US payrolls report for January. In terms of companies that I'm keeping an eye out for in my week ahead, it's we've got a quite a couple of important, well, more than a couple of important earnings announcements. We've got Big Oil um, reporting over the course of the next week or so, BP um, and Royal Dutch Shell. And it's been quite a year for BP. It's forced to raise an extra $10 billion in the form of a new revolving credit facility, as well as issuing $7 billion in new bonds in April last year, and then took a $15 billion write down in June. It's also announced the loss of 10,000 jobs. So it was no surprise in August when they were finally forced to accept the inevitable and cut the dividend in half. Now, um, it is slowly starting to acknowledge the fact that it needs to move to a much more renewables focused business model. And one thing that I think will have helped it, along with Royal Dutch Shell over the course of the past few weeks, is the rebound in the oil price, which will have improved its refining margins. BP has a break even price of $42 a barrel. So it's above its break even price. That should be positive for profits. The only concern that I have about is BP is demand for refining products. We're all stuck at home. We're not driving anywhere near as much as we used to be. Airlines aren't flying. So on the demand side, it could well be that it hasn't sold much in the way of refining products, even though it's getting more for its oil. So the big, I think the big thing for me is this series of lows through here around about um, the, the, the 250 area. We've, we've come off the highs um, from um, earlier this month. We are now starting to converge back to the long-term directional moving averages, which are moving positive. Uh, which would appear to suggest there is room for a rebound, but I think much will depend on how BP paints its outlook, how its performing while transforming strategy is going, and what other steps it is looking to um, take in terms of um, improving its renewables business. Its light source business has already continued to expand. It's acquired the responsibility for a solar panel portfolio in Spain. So it'll be interesting to find out whether or not Bernard Looney's targets are on track or whether or there are likely to be any setbacks. It's a similar sort of story for Royal Dutch Shell. We can see that here from this chart. It's amazing how similar the profile of the price movement is with BP and Royal Dutch Shell. And also similar sort of support in and around December for, for for um, Royal Dutch Shell, around about 12.35, 12.40. Um, so there should be a decent area of support through there. Again, um, the same factors that will dictate how the share price for Royal Dutch Shell moves will be the same as for BP. And as I say, the numbers for Royal Dutch Shell, they are out on the 4th of February. For BP, they are out on the 2nd of February. So there should be some trading opportunities for there. We've also got BT Group, we've got Vodafone, um, some big numbers there. And on the US, we've got Amazon.com or Amazon. And as we can see from here, this has been pretty unremarkable. We're certainly decent area of range trading through here for Amazon. Um, I think in terms of Microsoft's numbers earlier this week, the cloud business did very, very well. Um, and as such, I would expect to pay close attention to Amazon's web services division, given the fact that it has been a key contributor to Amazon's profits over the course of the last 12 months. It's seen revenue growth of 29% in the last two quarters, and it accounts now for 12.1% of total revenue for Amazon. So while Amazon is ripping up trees in retail, 
in terms of its prime um, subscription rates. It's also been ripping up trees in terms of web services. The big question is how much of it is already in the price and whether or not it can break out this trifecta of peaks here around about 33.60 going forward. One of the things that has gone in Amazon's favour over the course of the past quarter has been the fact that the Amazon Prime Video app can now be installed on Sky Q boxes. So you don't need a separate item if you're a Sky Q subscriber. You can just basically log in to the app via there. And you've also and they they have they placed a much greater emphasis on sport with rugby union and Premier League football games. So Premier League football games. So they should get a whole host of new users there as well. Um, also got Alphabet, um, that's Q4, 2nd of February, and we've got Peloton. Now Peloton's going to be interesting because of the fact that Apple launched a new subscription and new fitness bundle. And it will be interesting to see whether or not Peloton um, has seen its um, growth in subscriber numbers cannibalized by Apple's much cheaper option. Pe Peloton's been a big, big winner um, of the online boom in online fitness. We can see that here over the course of the past year. Really, really um, decent share price gains. But as we can see from here, it does appear to be consolidating in and around these levels here. So I think for me, um, I'll be paying, paying particular attention to this area of lows through here, 140. Let me just extend that back to see whether or not it's acted as a decent level in the past. Now, and as we can see, it has. It's this previous peak here of around about 139, 140 and through here. So I think a significant break below 140 could trigger a bit of stop loss selling, a bit of bit of profit taking after this potential triple top breakout that we've got forming on Peloton Interactive. So certainly keeping an eye on that particular chart over the course of the next week or so when Peloton reports its Q2 numbers on the 4th of February. So just looking at my sheet of paper to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything or I haven't left anything out. You can always view my week ahead in the news and analysis section on the CMC Markets website. Otherwise, um, all that's left for me to do is remind you of the non-farm payrolls webinar, which is a regular feature every month on the first Friday, which I will be hosting at 1.15. You can sign up to that um, from the events part of the website. And um, hopefully um, we will have some decent market moves over the course of the next few days as um, and um, obviously enjoy your weekend as well. So thanks very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.